My name is Alex Porter, and this happened to me on February 21st, 1997. It was my first solo field assignment with the CIA. Well, solo in the loosest of terms. Being new to the Classified Operations Division, I still wasn't sure exactly what kind of rabbit hole they were sending me down, only that it all sounded a little too outlandish, even for us. My mission was to investigate a series of bizarre disappearances in and around the Okefenokee Swamp. Sprawling across the border between southeastern Georgia and northern Florida, the Okefenokee is one of the largest intact freshwater wetlands in the U.S., a primeval wilderness where legends of strange beasts and lost civilizations have echoed for centuries. I'd always been a skeptic, a rational man in a world that sometimes defied all reason. Still, I couldn't deny the growing sense of uneasiness gnawing at me as I made my way down to Hickox, a tiny town on the swamp's edge. Hickox was the kind of place you miss if you blink driving down the highway. A general store, a gas station, a worn-out diner with faded Coca-Cola signs. The kind of place where locals eye out of towners with a mix of curiosity and suspicion. I sought out the local sheriff, Sheriff Hank Bell. A bear of a man, Sheriff Bell had a face etched with deep lines that spoke of long, hard days and maybe even longer nights. He greeted me with a drawl as slow and thick as molasses and a handshake that crushed my fingers. As expected, the sheriff was a man of few words. Ain't much to tell, Sheriff Bell said, leaning back in his creaky chair. Folks go missing. Hikers, the occasional hunter. Never turn up no trace, no scent. I asked him about the rumors, about local legends whispered around campfires. He dismissed them out of hand just tall tales from a bored town. Still, there was a glint in his eye, a hesitation I couldn't quite place. After leaving the station, I decided to walk around town. Locals watched me from their porches, their stares lingering longer than what felt comfortable. I decided to try the diner, hoping to pick up some conversation, maybe a scrap of local gossip that the sheriff wouldn't share. Inside, the diner buzzed with a low hum of chatter. I took a seat at the counter and ordered some truly horrible coffee and a slice of apple pie that was surprisingly good. Next to me sat an old man with faded tattoos and a weathered cowboy hat. He seemed to be nursing the same cup of coffee he'd had when I walked in. After a couple of glances my way, he spoke, his voice hoarse. You that fella asking about the vanishings? I'm looking into it, I replied keeping my response intentionally vague. The old man stared into the dark depths of his mug, his face unreadable. Ever hear tell of the swamp blower? He had my attention. Can't say I have. Most ain't, he muttered. Old folk's story. Parents used to warn kids misbehaving, saying the swamp blower'd come get him in the night, snatched him up, never to be seen again. He leaned in closer, lowering his voice. Thing is, sometimes even grown folk disappear. Folks would know these swamps better than their own backyard. He shrugged, his eyes clouded with something like fear. I thanked the old man, leaving my untouched coffee on the counter. Back at my motel that night I tried to write a report, to find logic in all this. The missing person cases were few, spread out over decades. Could it all be explained by accidents, animal attacks, or deliberate vanishings? Sleep was a restless affair filled with strange, vivid dreams, whispers of something moving in the shadows, a feeling of being watched by unseen eyes. It was hard to shake the image of the old man in the diner, the conviction in his voice. The next morning, I decided to get into the swamp myself, to see firsthand what I was dealing with. I rented an old battered John boat from a bait shop and set off alone, armed only with a map, a compass, and the old man's unsettling story in my head. The deeper I ventured into the Okafinoki, the more oppressive it felt. The air was still and humid, the dense tangle of cypress trees and lily pads closing in around me. The water was dark, reflecting the twisted branches like skeletal fingers reaching out from below. There was a primeval silence, 
broken only by the croaking of frogs and the relentless buzz of mosquitoes. Hours passed as I navigated the maze-like waterways. The sense I wasn't alone grew with each twist and turn of the boat. I swore I could hear rustling in the undergrowth, as if something just out of sight was paralleling my movements. Every rustle, every splash, sent a jolt of adrenaline through my system. Yet, each time I turned my head, I saw nothing but the endless tangle of vegetation. With the sun starting its slow descent, I decided to head back. Turning the John boat around a particularly dense cluster of cypress, I suddenly recoiled. There, not ten feet away, was a face. Not a human face, though. It was broad and flattened, eyes set wide apart and bulging. Its mouth stretched in a wide grimace, revealing rows of jagged teeth. The skin was a mottled green-brown, textured like rough bark. The stench hit me next, a foul mix of rotting vegetation and stagnant water. Before I could process what I was seeing, the creature lunged. I barely had time to raise my arm before its claws ripped across my chest, sending a jolt of pain through my body. The creature's weight slammed into the boat, its momentum nearly capsizing us. I stumbled, my gun slipping from my grasp as I fought to regain my footing. The creature hissed, a sound like rusted nails against wet glass, before diving beneath the murky surface. Scrabbling in the bottom of the boat, I managed to retrieve my weapon and shakily aimed it at the water, heart pounding like a war drum against my ribs. The creature didn't resurface. I sat there, gasping for breath, unable to tear my gaze from the spot where it had disappeared. My arm throbbed and blood seeped through my torn shirt. The sun dipped below the tree line, casting long, ominous shadows across the swamp. I knew I needed to get out of there, to get back and report. Report what? Whatever that creature was, it could not be explained away. It didn't fit the profile of any known animal, of any local legend. The swamp blower of the old man's tales made real? It was crazy, but a part of me clung to that ridiculous story as the only thing that made any sort of sense. Panic started to worm its way through my veins. I turned the boat, frantically working the small outboard motor, desperate to put as much distance between myself and that thing as I could. The air grew heavy, the sense of something watching me intensifying with each passing second. The ride back through the twilight was a blur of fear and adrenaline. Every snag in the water looked like the creature in my terror-fueled imagination. I had no idea if it was stalking me, waiting for the opportune moment to attack again. When I finally reached the dock, night had well and truly fallen, cloaking the swamp in impenetrable darkness. I stumbled back to my motel, clutching my injured arm and trying to rationalize what I'd seen. No matter how I twisted the events, there was no way I could write this off as an animal attack. I cleaned my wounds as best I could and wrapped them with a ragged towel, ignoring the throbbing pain. I needed to report this, needed to warn the locals. I reached for the phone, but as I lifted the receiver, a sound echoed through the room. A scraping sound, a dragging sound coming from under my bed. Frozen in terror, I slowly lowered the receiver. The noise stopped. I waited barely breathing, my heart pounding a frantic tattoo against my ribs. The scrape started again, closer this time, followed by a low, guttural growl that sent ice down my spine. My vision swam as a wave of dizziness washed over me. I was going to die here, in this run-down motel room at the edge of the swamp, torn to pieces by some nightmare creature straight out of folklore. I thought of the missing persons, of the sheriff's haunted look and the old man's whispered warnings in the diner. Then, a surge of anger cut through my fear. I wasn't going down without a fight. Grabbing the lamp from the bedside table, I slowly lowered myself to the floor, peering into the darkness. There it was. Its reptilian eyes glowed with a predatory gleam in the dim light filtering in from the bathroom. The creature's massive form was wedged halfway under the bed, 
and I watched in horrified fascination as it attempted to pull itself free. The muscles along its back rippled as it strained against the space, splintering the cheap wooden frame with a loud crack. I lunged forward, swinging the lamp with all my strength. It connected with the creature's head, sending it reeling back with a pained hiss. I swung again and again, driving it further back under the bed. There was a sudden tearing sound, followed by a shriek of pain that made my ears ring. Seizing the moment, I scrambled to my feet and sprinted for the door. I yanked it open, slammed it behind me, and ran. Bursting through the motel office, I desperately yelled for the man behind the desk. At first, there was only confused silence, and then a muffled boom like a gunshot, followed by a chilling bellow that shook the walls. I barely took shelter behind the front desk before the creature burst through the door, shattering the flimsy structure. There was another crash, and a scream cut short. The creature roared again, a sound of fury and pain. I knew then it wouldn't pursue me, not right away. Crouched on the dirty carpet, I could hear the sounds of destruction, the creature's enraged movements muffled by the flimsy walls. Sheriff Bell arrived within the hour, lights flashing and sirens wailing. When he and his men stormed in, weapons drawn, I heard more gunshots, followed by an eerie silence. Cautiously, they searched the wreckage of the room. When they finally emerged, the disbelief on their faces was almost comical. The body was gone. All that remained was a scattering of dark blood staining the carpet, an overturned bed, and a splintered doorway hanging off its hinges as a testament to the night's horrors. At the hospital, they stitched my wounds closed and gave me a hefty dose of painkillers. Sheriff Bell sat by my bed, staring off into the middle distance. He told me no one had believed him, that his reports about the missing persons, the strange circumstances, had been dismissed as the ramblings of a small-town lawman with an overactive imagination. I reckon I ain't the only one owes you an apology, he said softly. His face was weathered and tired, like something essential had been carved out of him. When I was released from the hospital, they handed me a file. It was my case report, heavily redacted. The cause of the incident was officially listed as an unknown animal attack. The disappearance of the motel clerk was classified as a separate missing persons case. I knew my report, when it reached Langley, would be relegated to some forgotten archive, joining countless other unexplained encounters. I left Hickox the very same day, driving until the Okafenoki was nothing but a speck in my rearview mirror. In the years that followed, I took on different missions, saw my share of darkness in far-flung corners of the world. But the incident in the swamp lingered, a shadow I could never fully outrun. There would always be nights where I woke in a cold sweat, the reek of stagnant water heavy in the air, the piercing yellow eyes of the creature fresh in my mind. Sometimes I'd see news reports out of Georgia, unexplained disappearances on the edge of a vast wilderness, cases forever unsolved. I knew without a doubt that it was continuing its gruesome work in the depths of the Okafenoki. The aftermath is a quiet sort of haunting. I moved on with my life, got married, had a daughter. But a piece of me remains trapped back in that mosquito-infested swamp. I told myself in the beginning that the creature was an anomaly, some evolutionary aberration or undiscovered species. Over time I've come to the chilling realization that might not be the whole truth. There were rumors in the agency, whispers about things lurking in remote corners of the earth, and sometimes late at night when my daughter is fast asleep. I wonder how many more creatures like the Swamp Blower exist, hidden in the darkness, and how long it will be before they come out of the shadows. My name is Lucas Kane, and this happened to me on July 23, 2008. I'm an agent with the CIA, one of those guys who gets sent in when things get so weird even the regular agents wash their hands of it. Monsters like the one I encountered in the Everglades. 
Let's just say they don't make it into official briefings. The Everglades are a primordial place, a vast expanse of water, mangroves and sun-bleached sawgrass stretching to the horizon. Alligators slide beneath the murky water, exotic birds shriek overhead, and the air thrums with the buzz of a billion insects. A place designed to remind you just how small and insignificant humans are in the grand scheme of things. Officially, I was sent to investigate suspected eco-terrorism. Poachers, smugglers, the usual swamp rats causing trouble. The reality? Well, that was far more disturbing. Locals were whispering about mutilated livestock, mangled beyond any known predator attack. And then there were the disappearances. Hunters and hikers vanishing without a trace in the tangled waterways. Those vanishing sent a shiver down my spine, a prickle of unease the years of training couldn't fully suppress. I teamed up with a park ranger named Anya, a tough, sun-weathered woman with a no-nonsense attitude and a haunted look in her eyes. She'd grown up in the swamps, knew the territory like the back of her hand. Anya didn't believe in old wives' tales, but there was an edge to her voice when she relayed the chilling stories passed down by generations of her people. We spent most of a week combing through the swamp, finding nothing except oppressive heat and clouds of mosquitoes. Locals cast us wary glances, reluctant to break their code of silence about what lurked in the depths. Just when I was ready to chalk it up as another overblown conspiracy theory, we got our first solid lead. A hysterical family stumbled out of the mangroves, babbling about their fishing trip turned nightmare. Their boat was half-sunken, shredded as if clawed by some massive animal. More disturbing was their description of the creature they swore had attacked them, a hulking, amphibious beast with glowing eyes. After calming them down, Anya and I went to investigate. The boat was a wreck, just as they'd described. But it was the smell that hit me first, a rank, swampy odor overlaid with something sharp and metallic, blood. Lots of it, staining the splintered wood. Whatever had attacked the boaters, it hadn't been an alligator. We set up camp at the edge of the sawgrass, Anya and I falling into a tense silence broken only by the croaking of frogs and the rustle of creatures unseen in the darkness. The feeling of being watched prickled the back of my neck. I knew instinctively that we were no longer the hunters, but the hunted. Nightfall transformed the swamp. Each rustle and splash seemed amplified, every shadow a potentially deadly threat. Then, just as the last light was draining from the sky, we heard it. A low, guttural growl that sent shivers down my spine. Anya and I exchanged a grim look. The hunt was on. We moved cautiously, flashlights cutting arcs through the gloom. The creature was stalking us, intelligent and patient. I caught glimpses of its movement in the underbrush, flashes of yellow eyes reflecting back the pale moonlight. Suddenly, it lunged from the mangroves, a monstrous eruption of scales and claws. Its size was staggering, easily twice the height of a man, and built like a tank. Its skin was leathery, mottled with shades of green and brown, camouflaging it perfectly in its environment. A massive, elongated snout ended in rows of razor-sharp teeth. Anya fired first, her rifle barking in the stillness. The creature seemed more annoyed than hurt, letting out a deafening roar that vibrated through the swamp. That roar was my first mistake. It drew attention. They came from the water, a whole pack of them. Sleek bodies slithered through the murky depths, glowing eyes fixed on us with predatory hunger. We were surrounded, Run! I shouted at Anya, knowing even as I said it that it was futile. The creatures hit us like a wave, claws tearing and teeth gnashing. Anya screamed, her gun clattering to the muddy ground. I fought back desperately, firing wildly into the thrashing bodies. One of the creatures latched onto my leg, its jaws crushing down on my calf. I screamed, the pain blinding 
and kicked out frantically. Somehow, I managed to scramble back, dragging my injured leg, leaving a trail of blood in my wake. Behind me, I heard the sounds of Anya's struggle cut short with a sickening gurgle. There was no time for grief, only survival. I stumbled through the swamp, every instinct screaming at me to get out, to escape. The creatures pursued, the sounds of their splashing growing closer. I could smell their fetid breath, hear their clicking claws on the roots and decaying vegetation. Any hope that I might outrun them was fading. I tripped, my bad leg giving out, and tumbled into the water. The shock of its surprising coldness momentarily cleared some of the pain-induced fog from my brain. Ahead, I saw the twisted, half-submerged roots of a massive mangrove. Desperate, I lunged for it, hauling myself into the tangle of branches. I clung to the mangrove roots, my breaths harsh and ragged in the swampy air. The creatures circled below, the water roiling with their movement. Their yellow eyes glinted up at me, burning with malevolent intelligence. They didn't seem inclined to follow me into the tangle of roots. Perhaps their size worked against them here. A small sliver of hope flickered in the crushing despair. My injured leg throbbed with agonizing intensity. I ripped a strip from my shirt and fashioned a crude tourniquet, gritting my teeth against waves of white-hot pain. If I didn't get out of here soon, infection or blood loss would finish what those monsters had started. The creatures, perhaps sensing my weakening state, grew bolder. One lunged forward, snapping its jaws just short of my dangling feet. Another attempted to scale the massive roots, only to slip back with an angry hiss. With a jolt of dread, I realized the water level was slowly rising. High tide. Soon my precarious refuge would be well within reach of those razor-sharp claws. Panic flared inside me, hot and blinding. I had to move, but where? The mangrove stood alone, an island amidst a vast expanse of water and sawgrass. Despair wrapped icy fingers around my heart. Then, through the haze of pain, I saw it. A flicker of light in the distance. Not the eerie glow of the creature's eyes, but a steady beam. A boat. Hope surged, hot and desperate. I cupped my hands around my mouth and shouted, my voice hoarse and weak against the vast emptiness of the swamp. The boat didn't change course. Either they hadn't heard or didn't care about some random yelling madman in the middle of nowhere. I shouted again, adding a desperate wave of my good arm. Still no response. Just as despair threatened to consume me again, the boat shifted course, turning slowly in my direction. Salvation. It took an agonizingly long time for the small airboat to reach me. Each minute felt like an hour, the creatures below growing more restless with every inch the water rose. I thought I heard gunfire, distant and muffled, followed by the fading echoes of those monstrous roars. Perhaps someone else was out there, buying me precious time. When the airboat finally drew close, two figures leaned over the edge. Hang tight! A burly, bearded man yelled. We saw the whole thing, damn swamp monsters! Relief washed over me so strong it nearly buckled my knees. I wasn't crazy. I wasn't alone. With their help, I managed to clamber aboard, collapsing in an exhausted heap. As the airboat sped away, I saw the mangrove sink below the waterline, the predators swarming over the last of my sanctuary. The aftermath was a blur. There were paramedics, a dingy field hospital, a whirlwind of official questions that I couldn't fully answer. They found Anya's remains, or what little the creatures had left of her. I never learned what happened to the boaters who helped rescue me. The official report chalked the whole thing up to a freak alligator attack, with my trauma-filled ramblings about a pack of monsters dismissed as hallucinations. I was medically discharged from the CIA. The gnawing ache in my leg is a constant reminder of that night, and my mangled calf might as well be branded with the truth the government will never acknowledge. Most nights, I lie awake, the guttural roars of the creatures and Anya's dying screams echoing in my ears. Sleep offers no respite, 
only vivid nightmares of clawed hands dragging me back down into the murky depths. I moved into a high-rise apartment in the heart of a bustling city, steel and concrete, and as far from the natural world as I could get. I cover the windows with blackout blinds, never quite able to banish the feeling of those yellow eyes watching me from the darkness. Someone else at the agency took over my old case files, the ones that detail encounters too bizarre, too horrifying for the official records. Sometimes I wonder if they found other victims, other survivors like me. Most times I push the thought away. It's safer not to know. The creatures of the Everglades still prowl their watery domain, unseen and unacknowledged by the wider world. And I... I survive. I exist. Some might even call it living. But I know the truth. The monsters are real. And one fateful, blood-soaked night, they left their mark on me, body and soul. Sometimes late at night when the city seems to fall silent, I swear I can hear the distant rustling of the sawgrass and the soft splash of scaled bodies in the water. And I know it's only a matter of time until the swamp creatures come calling again. My name is Eric Townsend, and this happened to me in August of 2008. Back then, I was the epitome of the straight-laced government agent, suit and tie, shiny shoes, and a mind full of classified protocols. Now? Well, let's just say the suit doesn't fit anymore, and the shine's long gone off the world. They sent me to investigate a cluster of disappearances on the outskirts of Phoenix, Arizona. Hikers, campers, even a few homeless folks drawn to the desert edge vanished without a trace. Locals muttered about cartel violence, but there was a wrongness to the whole pattern. Too clean, too thorough. I figured it was something more organized. A cult, maybe. The Bureau has a file on every flavor of lunatic, after all. My partner was Agent Garcia, seasoned, cynical, the kind of guy who'd seen too much darkness to be rattled anymore. We went undercover, jeans and hiking boots instead of crisp suits. Spent our days poking around the desert fringes, interviewing jittery witnesses, trying to piece together some thread of logic. A local ranger tipped us off about a system of caves out east of the city, rumored to be used for drug smuggling. Figured it was worth a look. A cult or cartel might hole up in a place like that. We went out under cover of darkness. The desert air was crisp, filled with a strange hum that set my teeth on edge. Cicadas, maybe, but too rhythmic. Flashlights cut through the gloom as we approached the cave mouth. The smell hit us first, metallic and sweet, like overripe fruit and old blood mixed together. Garcia swore under his breath, hand drifting to his sidearm. We edged cautiously into the darkness. The interior was surprisingly smooth, like the walls had been melted or carved, not formed naturally. Our flashlights picked up glistening trails on the ground, a viscous, iridescent slime. Then we found the source. Bones, half dissolved, stripped of flesh, littered the cavern floor. They were segmented, insectile, like nothing I'd ever seen. And the size of them, it implied a creature straight out of a nightmare. Let's get the hell out of here, I hissed. There was too much bad history in those bones, too clear a sign that whatever lurked here wasn't human. We were halfway to the cave mouth when Garcia tripped. His flashlight went skittering, tumbling end over end into the blackness. Before we could react, the hum changed pitch, rising to a whine that drilled into my skull. The creature erupted from the darkness, a blur of chitinous plates and writhing limbs. It was far bigger than the bones suggested the size of a small car. The head. It was a writhing mass of segmented eyes and dripping mandibles. It let loose a shriek somewhere between a buzzsaw and a howl that set off every alarm bell in my body. Garcia, bless him, didn't freeze. He opened fire, the gunshots deafening in the enclosed space. The rounds pinged off the thing's armor, barely slowing it down. It lunged for him, 
one segmented leg scything through the air. Garcia leapt aside, rolled with the impact, but not fast enough. The claw sliced his leg open, a spray of crimson across the rock. He screamed, more in rage than pain. Run! He roared at me. Don't look back, just run! I didn't need telling twice. I scrambled for the cave mouth, the creature's roar echoing behind me. Halfway out, I risked a glance back. Garcia had his back to a wall, emptying his pistol into the oncoming monstrous form. But the creature was too fast, too strong. I saw the claw sweep down, saw Garcia's body lifted, then the wet crunch as he was... I turned away, bile rising in my throat and bolted out into the desert night. I ran until my lungs burned, until I collapsed, gasping on the sandy ground. The creature didn't follow. Maybe the gunshot spooked it. Maybe it preferred dark spaces. It didn't matter. I was alive. Garcia was... Garcia was dead, fulfilling that most dreaded of agent duties, sacrificial pawn to buy time. I got up shakily, stumbled my way back to civilization. The aftermath is the usual bureaucratic mess. The Bureau sanitized the incident, covering up Garcia's death as a freak hiking accident. I know better. They offered me a desk job, compensation for my ordeal. I took it, though a part of me rebelled against the safety. My apartment has the blinds drawn 24-7, and I jump at every creak in the floorboards. That hum, the insectile whine, lingers in my dreams, and with it the image of Garcia's shattered body. People tell me I'm lucky to be alive. I guess. But some days out here in the gray anonymity of my new life, I feel more trapped than ever, just waiting for the darkness to seep up through the cracks. Because that creature is still out there. Somewhere in the depths of those desert caves, it lives, it grows. Breeding, maybe. Creating more of its monstrous kind. And the next time someone ventures too close... The next time some curious hiker or hapless soul stumbles on its lair, there won't be anyone like Garcia to save them. My name is Miles Harrison, and this happened to me in the spring of 2012. I'm a covert ops specialist for the CIA. That's the cleaned-up version. The truth is I handle the dirty work no official report will ever acknowledge. Spent half my life overseas, in the shadows, so when they tell me to pack my bags for a domestic assignment, I know something's gone seriously wrong. The briefing was short and unsettling. Outbreaks of extreme violence in a stretch of remote Appalachian forest land. Multiple missing persons reports, mostly out-of-town hikers and campers, the kind easily dismissed as accidents, if not for the sheer volume. My gut instinct said drug cartel, gone feral off-grid. Seen things like that in South America. But this was America, and my superiors were jumpy, whispering about bioterrorism and the like. I set up camp near the edge of the forest, an old fishing shack on a barely used road. Locals weren't much help, tight-lipped, looking at me like I was the threat, not whatever lurked in those woods. They called the disappearances the hush. Folks go in, nobody comes out, no bodies ever found. Spent my first few days doing recon. The forest was eerily silent. Not the normal chirps and rustles of life, but a heavy, oppressive quiet that settled over you like a damp blanket. Even in the height of summer, there was a coldness in the air that made my skin crawl. A couple of times I heard noises, shuffling sounds, the crack of a branch but too far away to pinpoint. It felt like being watched, a prickly sensation of unseen eyes tracking my every move. I started leaving trail markers, bits of colored fabric tied to trees, a broken twig propped against a rock, just little things but the kind a savvy tracker like myself could notice if they were disturbed. Then, on my fifth night out, something changed. An animal, 
I told myself at first. Big one. Maybe a bear. The low growls were guttural, laced with something I wouldn't label hunger. It circled my cabin, close enough that I could hear it breathing, feel the vibrations of its footsteps against the worn floorboards. I holed up inside, rifle trained on the door. Adrenaline thrummed through me, the taste of copper in my mouth. Part of me, the old operative part, was coldly assessing the perimeter, the weak points, how long I could hold out. And then it let loose a howl, a high-pitched screech that split the night and made my blood run cold. This wasn't a bear. It wasn't any damn thing I could name. The sun rose and the noises stopped. I ventured out cautiously, weapon at the ready. All was still, but the cabin had been marked, shallow claw marks across the door, and splatters of something dark and sticky that I didn't want to identify. I spent the day setting traps, the kind used on big game in Africa, and rigging the perimeter with motion sensor lights. My hands moved efficiently, but my mind raced. This assignment went way beyond my pay grade. I needed backup, experts, anyone who could explain what in the fresh hell I was up against. The radio signal was spotty out here. I finally managed to get a message out. Garbled, full of static, but enough to get the point across that the situation was officially out of control. The reply was curt, promising a team en route. Estimated arrival, two days. Two days with my back against the wall, alone against whatever stalked these woods. Night fell, and it brought terror with it. My traps remained undisturbed, a testament to whatever creature was hunting me being too cunning or too unnatural to be caught like an animal. The noises were different this time, more purposeful. I picked up movement on two corners of the cabin simultaneously. Then, the roof. A low, rasping sound, like nails across slate. I fired at the ceiling, more out of panic than strategy. Wood splintered, revealing a glimpse of the night sky and, dear God, two eyes, glowing crimson in the darkness. I scrambled back as something heavy landed on the floorboards above me, causing the whole cabin to groan in protest. Panic fueled me now. I threw a flare out the window, the burst of light momentarily cutting through the gloom. It was then that I truly saw it. A blur of bone-white flesh streaked with dried blood, a skeletal torso balanced on impossibly long limbs that ended in vicious claws. Its head. It had the shape of a human skull, but stretched and twisted into something wrong, a gaping maw lined with rows of serrated teeth. I fired at it. Bullets ripped into its form, and it howled in rage, but didn't go down. It tore through the roof, escaping with a final screech that echoed in my ears long after the maddening silence had returned. The aftermath of the attack was pure chaos. The flare had lit some of the undergrowth, sending flames racing through the dry brush. I had to move, get out ahead of the inferno. Grabbing whatever gear I could salvage, I bolted out the back door as the cabin started to collapse in on itself. The fire at my back offered some twisted protection. I doubted the creature would risk the flames in pursuit, but I couldn't linger. I sprinted through the trees, the smoke and darkness blinding me, forcing me to navigate by instinct and a fading familiarity with the layout of the land from my initial recon runs. My trail markers, they were gone, torn down, destroyed, or consumed by the blaze. I was well and truly lost, with whatever beast I'd enraged somewhere out there, biding its time in the night. The firestorm raged for hours, turning a swath of the forest into a charred wasteland. Come dawn, I found myself on a barren, rocky outcrop and did a shaky headcount. I'd lost the trail cams, most of my food rations, and was down to a few precious rounds of ammunition. On any other op, this would have sent me into crisis prep mode. But after the night I'd just endured, there was a grim acceptance. Standard survival protocols didn't matter when the enemy wasn't human. I spent a chilling day nestled in a crag, 
the distant smoke a constant reminder of the destruction I'd left behind. It gnawed at me, the thought of the locals caught in the crossfire. Were they all right? What if the creature, driven from its usual hunting grounds, turned its rage on them? I used what was left of the daylight to relocate, found a cave in a nearby ridge, defensible, a good vantage point. It seemed untouched, no signs of blood or recent habitation. Yet, I couldn't shake the sense of trespass, like I was barging into a predator's den. Night descended, bringing the noises back. Not the brazen attack of before, but a more cautious circling. It knew where I was. I barricaded the cave entrance as best I could, a pathetic shield against the strength I'd witnessed firsthand. My only advantage? This place was tight, limiting its maneuverability. If it came for me here, maybe, just maybe, I wouldn't go down without a fight. The standoff lasted hours. I sat in the darkness, rifle trembling in my sweaty hands, eyes glued to the slivers of moonlight coming through the barricade. Every rustle of dry leaves, every snap of a distant twig, sent my heart thudding. It came not through attack, but subterfuge. A sound directly above my cave, a scraping like claws against stone. It was on the roof, trying to get in from a different angle. I aimed, fired, and the noise ceased abruptly, followed by a heavy thump. Silence stretched on. Had I hit it? Killed it? I didn't dare hope. Something stank outside the cave, a rotting, fetid odor that turned my stomach. First light came, and cautiously I moved the barricade. The creature lay just outside, sprawled on the rocks. In death, it looked smaller, almost pathetic. Sunlight revealed the extent of the damage I'd inflicted. Several bullet holes peppered its torso. One had pierced an eye socket. But what made my breath hitch was the wound on the underside of its neck. Not a gunshot, but a long, ragged slash, like something else had clawed its way through its throat. I never got my backup team. By the time I made my way down to a ranger station, half-starved and babbling a lunatic's account, the only evidence I could offer was my mangled radio and the decaying corpse rapidly being dismissed as a bear carcass mangled by coyotes. The official's eyes said it all. Wilderness shock, battle fatigue, maybe even a touch of pity. My return to civilization was a nightmare of its own. Classified debriefs, psych evals, the cold analysis of men in suits who saw a traumatized agent, not the unnatural horror I'd faced. They offered me reassignment, a quiet desk job where no one would question my sanity. I turned it down. Told them if they saw monsters in that forest, they could damn well find someone else to fight them. I sold my old condo, bought a used truck, and headed north, far away from the oppressive hush of those Appalachians. Found a tiny cabin for sale in the Alaskan backcountry. It's a different kind of isolation out here, clean and harsh in its vastness. They have bears, too, but the mundane kind, the kind you can track and anticipate. Most nights I sleep soundly, lulled by the wind and the creak of old wood. But some nights I wake up in a cold sweat, the smell of decay filling my nostrils. My rifles propped beside the door, just in case. And when the wind whistles through the distant peaks, it sounds a hell of a lot like that same bone-chilling howl that haunts my nightmares. Because the men in suits, they never got the full truth. That thing out in the woods, it wasn't the first of its kind. It wasn't alone. My name is Alex Thorne, and this happened to me on July 22, 1997, a day etched into my memory like a fresh scar. I was working undercover at the time, not your typical CIA desk job, no sir. My team operated in the shadows, handling threats that never made the evening news, the kind of work that earned you enemies but never a commendation medal. 
Three years back, I had a wife, Sarah. She was the light that drew me back from the darkness of my job. Then came that damn phone call, a car accident, and with it, my world went dark. I buried myself deeper into my work. It was the only way I knew how to cope. This particular assignment was, well, bizarre even by my standards. Something unsettling was brewing deep in the Ozarks. Reports of disappearances, locals whispering about strange lights in the forest, cattle mutilations. The official explanation was a drug cartel using the backwoods for nefarious activities. But after years on the job, you develop a sixth sense for when something just doesn't add up. My partner Donovan was a no-nonsense ex-marine, built like a tank with a voice that could rattle windows. Don't overthink it, Thorn, he'd growl whenever I'd voice my suspicions. Cartel thugs, pure and simple. The target was a remote farmhouse nestled amidst rolling hills cloaked in dense forest. Our intel was sketchy. Suspected drug lab, heavily armed, orders to infiltrate and secure evidence. Standard stuff, at least on the surface. Daylight was fading as we approached the farmhouse. An unnatural stillness choked the air. Donovan held up a fist, signaling a halt. Hold up, something's not right. Too quiet. I knew exactly what he meant. There was no hum of a generator, no flicker of lights, none of the usual signs of a remote operation. The hair prickled on the back of my neck. You finally getting those spook vibes too? I joked, trying to mask my growing unease. Donovan grunted, his eyes narrowed. This place has got a bad smell to it, Thorn. We moved as one, weapons drawn, boots crunching on gravel. Each step seemed to amplify the oppressive silence. I reached the weathered wooden porch, Donovan covering my back. The front door hung slightly ajar. You take point, Donovan said, already shouldering his rifle. I eased the door inward, peering into the gloom. The living room was a scene of frozen chaos, an overturned table, scattered papers, chairs lying on their sides as if knocked over in a hurry. Frowning, I took a cautious step inside. From the corner of my eye, I caught a flicker of movement in the hallway. I whipped around, rifle raised, but there was nothing there. Donovan, I saw it too, he muttered, his voice tense. Something ain't right here. We advanced, sweeping each room, kitchen, bedrooms, all empty, all showing signs of a hasty departure. Reaching the back of the house, I noticed a door leading down into a cellar. Even from where I stood, a faint, rotten stench drifted up, causing a wave of nausea to wash over me. Donovan nudged me with an elbow. Well, we ain't gonna find any meth cookers down there. I flicked on my flashlight, the beam slicing into the inky depths. I'll go first. Keep me covered, I said, the words coming out tighter than I intended. He didn't argue, merely nodded grimly. Taking a steadying breath, I began to descend the rickety wooden stairs. With each creak, my unease deepened. The beam of my flashlight illuminated a small, earthen-floored room. My stomach churned at the sight that awaited me. It was a scene ripped straight from a nightmare. Animal carcasses, deer, raccoons, maybe even a dog, lay in twisted piles, the floor awash in gore but it was the way the bodies were mutilated, the unnatural angles and gaping wounds that sent a jolt of pure horror through me. Sweet Jesus, Donovan muttered from above. I wanted to run, just turn and flee from this place of madness, but duty, or perhaps some flicker of morbid curiosity, kept me rooted to the spot. Slowly, I panned my light around the room. It snagged on something propped in the far corner, half hidden by shadows, a newspaper clipping pinned to the damp earth wall. The headline made my blood run cold. Locals baffled, sixth unexplained disappearance in two months. My breath hitched as I scanned the accompanying article. It detailed the vanishing of the farmhouse residents, a family of four. No trace, no clues, 
only whispers of strange occurrences in the weeks leading up to their disappearance. As I read, an icy dread settled over me. We weren't dealing with drug dealers. We were dealing with something else entirely. My flashlight beam darted back to the carcasses. These weren't the work of any wild animal. They were trophies, left behind by something both monstrous and methodical. A low growl echoed from the darkness, snapping my head around. Donovan shouted a warning from the top of the stairs, his voice laced with panic. Before I could register his words, the cellar erupted. A hulking form lunged from the shadows, a whirlwind of claws and teeth. I stumbled back, firing blindly as the creature barreled into me. The stench of it was overpowering, a mix of decay and something sulfurous that burned my lungs. Donovan's rifle roared from above, bullets tearing into the monstrosity. It roared, less like an animal and more like some twisted parody of a human scream. The force of the impact knocked me to the cellar floor, my rifle skittering away. Dazed, the world spinning, I saw a massive clawed hand swipe towards me. A searing pain ripped through my forearm. I scrambled away, scrambling for purchase on the slick, blood-soaked floor. The creature loomed over me, its silhouette a jagged distortion in the dim light filtering from above. For the first time, I got a clear look at it. It was massive, easily seven feet tall when hunched. Thick, leathery skin stretched over bulging muscles. The head was elongated, the muzzle filled with rows of razor-sharp teeth. But it was the eyes that sent shivers down my spine, glowing crimson orbs filled with a ravenous hunger. Another swipe of its claws sent me tumbling. The world tilted crazily, the creature's roar echoing in my skull. It pounced, pinning me to the floor with a weight that threatened to crush me. Hot, rancid breath washed over my face. I thrashed uselessly, but the creature held me fast. I was trapped, my final moments spent staring into the depths of those inhuman eyes. Suddenly, a flicker of movement above. Donovan, vaulting over the cellar railing, his rifle shattering the silence. The creature twisted its head, momentarily distracted. With a desperate surge of strength, I shoved against its chest, buying enough space to roll sideways. Donovan hit the floor beside me. His rifle barked again, the concussive blasts deafening in the enclosed space. I staggered upright, my vision swimming. The creature was wounded, crimson streaming from its flank, but it was far from dead. It circled us, low growls rumbling deep in its throat. Donovan ejected a spent clip and slammed in a fresh one. Thorn, get the hell out of here, he shouted. I didn't need telling twice. I scrambled for the stairs, my pulse hammering in my ears. Reaching the top, I risked a glance back. Donovan had emptied his magazine into the creature. It staggered, but still it came on. He fumbled for another clip, his face a mask of grim determination. There wasn't time. The creature lunged, a blur of claws and teeth. Donovan shouted a curse, throwing up his rifle in a futile attempt to block the attack. And then it was on him, a sickening symphony of tearing flesh and splintering bone echoing up the stairwell. My legs acted before my brain could process what I'd just witnessed. I slammed the cellar door shut and fumbled with the bolt. From below came a final, blood-curdling scream followed by a wet tearing sound. Stumbling backwards, I crashed into the kitchen table, sending it toppling. The world spun around me, my stomach lurching. Donovan was gone, sacrificed, buying me a few precious seconds. I didn't wait around to see what would emerge from the cellar. I tore through the kitchen, out the back door, and into the dense, suffocating forest. I ran until my lungs burned and my legs buckled beneath me. Branches whipped my face, thorns tore at my skin. But I didn't stop, the creature's inhuman growls echoing in my mind. I had no idea where I was going, only that I had to put as much distance between me and that accursed farmhouse as I could. Eventually, I stumbled onto a gravel road. In the growing pre-dawn light, I saw a truck approaching. Flagging it down with frantic desperation, I collapsed into the passenger seat, 
gasping out incoherent half-truths about a hunting accident and a friend in need of help. The driver, a grizzled old farmer, took one look at my wild eyes and blood-soaked clothes and didn't question a word. He drove me to the nearest town, where I made an anonymous call to the agency, my voice shaking. What I reported was standard protocol, an operation gone wrong, a firefight, my partner dead. What I didn't report was the creature. What I didn't report was the gnawing fear that it might still be out there, waiting, hunting. They called me a hero, pinned more medals on my chest, and buried Donovan with full honors. I played my part, the grieving survivor, all the while feeling like a coward who'd abandoned his post. In the empty silence of my apartment, the creature haunted my nightmares, its crimson eyes burning in the darkness. I left the agency soon after. Couldn't face the lies. Couldn't face the desks and the suits pretending monsters didn't exist in the shadowy corners of the world. Some cases don't end with closure. They leave scars on your soul. I drifted around for a while, taking odd jobs, trying to outrun my demons, but they always seemed to be one step behind. The truth is, you can't hide from something that might not even be human, something that exists outside the realm of logic and reason. Years have passed, but the memory of that day in the Ozarks hasn't faded. I see the creature's eyes every time I close mine. I hear its guttural growls echoing in my ears. I carry Donovan's death like a stone in my gut. People ask what happened to change me, to harden me. The answer is something they would never believe. Some truths are too terrible, too fantastical to survive the light of day. Those truths they keep locked up in windowless rooms with men in starch suits. I live on the edge of society now, a drifter, a ghost. The world sees me as broken, damaged. Maybe they're right. But then again, maybe I'm the only sane one left, the only one who sees the shadows lurking just out of sight. My name's Alex Tanner, and this happened to me in 2012. I work solo, mostly. Agency gives me assignments, drops me in the middle of nowhere, then lets me find my own way back. My marriage didn't survive the lifestyle. Ex-wife thinks I'm an accountant, which may be safer for everyone in the long run. This mission started with whispers, rumors of people vanishing in a remote corner of Utah Canyon country. Not tourists, mind you, locals, old-timers who knew the back trails. Folks assumed they'd just gotten lost until some of their remains turned up. Now, remains out in the wilderness aren't that unusual. Accidents happen. Animal attacks, sure. But these, they showed a kind of violence beyond cougars or wolves. The reports had me puzzled. Messy. Overkill, but with a strange precision. The locals were spooked, talking of something monstrous, something not natural. That's where I come in. The canyons were a maze of red rock and shadows when I set out. Hiked in under cover of darkness, set up camp in a hidden gully. Place gives me the creeps, to be honest. A stillness, unnatural for the desert. Even the insects seem subdued. Spent two days watching, waiting. Third night, it happened. Near full moon. I dozed off and woke to a prickling at the back of my neck. Movement in the darkness, slow, purposeful. My night vision's decent. I saw the silhouette against the skyline. Thing was huge, loping on two legs with an awkward grace. Too elongated to be human, too controlled to be an animal. There was intelligence in its movements, a chilling sort of focus. The next moments are a blur. I grab my rifle, not sure if it'd work against this, but something was better than nothing. It saw me then. It let out a hissing wail and lunged. I fired two shots, and it didn't even slow. I scrambled back, gun clattering from my grip and tripped on a rock. The thing was on me in a flash. It had hands, long-fingered and tipped with what looked like claws. 
One slashed across my chest. Pain exploded, white and blinding. I managed to grab my backup pistol and fired point blank. The creature screeched and stumbled back, giving me space to roll away. I glimpsed the damage I'd done. Holes in its torso leaking some kind of black, oily fluid. Yet, it still moved. Still stared at me with those burning eyes. There was no winning this fight. I turned and ran, fumbling through the darkness. I heard it crashing after me, but the canyons were a labyrinth. I sprinted, dodged, stumbled for what felt like hours. Sweat stung my eyes, blood pounded in my ears. Had to keep running. Had to survive. Finally, I risked a glance back. Nothing. I slumped to the ground, lungs aching, chest throbbing. That's when I heard the whimpering. A young woman was huddled a few yards away, staring at me with wide, frightened eyes. She was trembling, covered in dirt and scratches. I thought... I thought it had... She swallowed, voice hoarse. Been running for days. Turns out her name was Sarah, local hiker who'd ventured too far off the trail. The creature had snatched her three nights ago. Somehow she'd kept ahead of it, kept hidden. That takes guts I can barely fathom. Getting out of there was another hell. Dawn was breaking, and that meant danger. The creature, it didn't like the light. We took our chances, picked our way out of the canyons, found a ranger station, made up a story about a wild bear. They don't need to know the truth. Neither does anyone else. The agency patched me up, asked their usual questions. I gave them half-truths, enough to keep them satisfied without revealing the scale of the thing out there. Sarah vanished. Smart move. Best to make a fresh start after something like that. I've healed, mostly. The scars itch sometimes. Remind me. There are dark corners of this world where the maps end, where things that shouldn't exist still lurk and hunt. The agency wants me on another assignment. Up in Alaska this time. I've got no choice, really. Out there, the monsters have different names, different forms. But that hunger in the darkness, that's always the same. <laughs>